grumpy. Why? Well, just because I'm sleep deprived. You're not the only one. Don't know what I've just done. I've just touched something. Oh, yeah, I can only see that? your forehead and your eyes, Kev. <laughs> I'm, under a blank- I'm under a blanket. What have you ah. thought is wrong, Kev? Well, I don't want to go and disrupt the wife anymore and go and get a t-shirt. Um, right, hang on. We are recording now. Oh, good. Okay, cool. Are you naked? No, I've got boxes on. <laughs> I left a pair of boxes in Turin. I'm unhappy with that. I must have left you them under the bed. Did. Was that not your plan? No, that was my old boxes. I've I've left an actual decent pair of boxes. Anyway. Oh, there's four quid I'm not getting back. <laughs> good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Welcome back to the Fourth Italian Football Podcast. You've already heard Kev Borgowski. He's here with me. I'm Connor Clancy. Vito Doria is also here. Vito, hello. Hello, Connor. How are you? I'm very, very tired. And before Kev gets in, I'm also quite sleep deprived. <laughs> we had a big one. Kev, how are you? I'm good. I'm as cold, but considerably drier than when I left you on Saturday evening. Wow, Sunday you're morning. As cold. Yeah, it's freezing here. Really? It's cold here too, Kev, but you're under a blanket. Don't be complaining. Don't be complaining. Anything, anything eventful happened on Sunday after you left me at what, four in the morning or 2.30 in the morning, whenever it was? Uh, well, apart from that tree you pushed over outside of my accommodation. Um, so how am I getting blamed for this? <laughs> I don't know. I just saw it. I thought of you. I thought you'd gone on a little, a little Connor rampage with like, the couple of hours you had before you boarded your train in the early hours. That's not in my character. When have I ever gone on a rampage? Come on. No. You know it better. was probably the awful, awful Turin weather. Probably. It was horrendous. We'll get there. Um, let's dive straight into the Serie A fixtures, shall we? We'll start with the weekend's first game and probably what was, is it fair to say, the biggest game of the weekend beforehand? Definitely the two highest ranked teams that went head to head. Atalanta, Juventus at the Stadio Atleti as already Italia. Atalanta went 1 0 up. Juventus came back to win 3 1. Vito. Juve were lucky. You could say that because probably they only really looked good in the last 20 minutes or so, and that was because Gonzalo Higuain turned the game around. Uh, Most of the time, especially in the first half, Atalanta had most of the chances and the play. And perhaps if Musa Barrow didn't hit the crossbar with that penalty, the momentum of the game would have been very different. Unfortunately, as we've become accustomed to for the last eight years or so, you'll just have that extra individual quality that can turn games around. And unfortunately for Ladea, um, Juve did it against them and uh, Gasparini's side weren't able to convert their chances when they really needed to. Yeah, you say we've become accustomed to this in the last eight years. Atalanta have been dealing with this for the last 18 years because... They've not beaten Juve since 2001 in Serie A. Obviously, they thumped them in the Coppa Italia last year en route to the final. But this wasn't one of those typical Atalanta-Juve games, Kev, because Atalanta can probably feel quite hard done by. Gonzalo Higuain scored twice. Of course, he always scores when he plays Atalanta. Should he have even been on the pitch? Because there was an incident where, I think it was for the first goal, where he just kicked Jose Luis Palomino, and for some reason it wasn't pulled up for a foul. And then he had that stamp on Pierluigi Golini, which you've seen Inter fans complain about. Um, Matias Vecino got sent off for an identical challenge on Mario Mandzukic, was it last season or the year before? So Iguain fortunate to stay on the pitch to score his goals and provide the assist. Yeah, I think he is fortunate, but he's, it's one of those that go either way, and I think... You've seen across plenty of major leagues and, you know, maybe even maybe international tournaments that the bigger side tends to get those calls, whether it's right or wrong. And yeah, he was he just did what he what he had to do. And I think it's I'd be a little bit more positive with saying that that's what Juve do as opposed to them being maybe lucky. But Atalanta can certainly feel agreed that they didn't take their take their chances. I want to pick at this Higuain thing a little bit more. We're going to talk about how good he is because I love Gonzalo Higuain. 
But Vito, I can't quite work out why that goal wasn't ruled out because obviously with it being a an incident that involved a goal, surely VAR would have looked at it and said, I can't, I don't remember who was actually the VAR official on the day, but would have flagged, okay, there's a clear off the ball kick here. Um, ref, you might want to pull that back and give a free kick. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you could have had that go disallowed, but I thought in, but without going to that specific incident, I thought in general the particular refereeing was rather poor. And if it wasn't for that goal, it was for the incident on Golini with a stomp that should have been picked up. And then even with the second goal, there was a handball from Quadrado that wasn't picked up immediately. So I think on VAR, it, on their part, I think it's poor not to say something. And then, look, I'm speaking specifically from what I see on social media. There's a strong agenda against Gianluca Rocchi and that he gives the Juventus too much of a benefit of a doubt. Now, I don't want to make accusations or anything like that because, you know, I don't know what proof there is if Rocky does somehow have a chat with uh, Juve on the side. But you can see why people on social media or, you know, trolls, keyboard warriors, they push this narrative or agenda linking Juventus and and Gianluca Rocky. So it's... It's bad on you, Uber, but it's very bad on Gianluca Rocchi. I think in future games, if he doesn't watch out, he's got to be able to make the tough calls. And also, you know, if hypothetically something goes against Juventus's way, if there's a red card offence, he's got to have the courage to pull out the red cards. Um, otherwise, yeah, one day it might just look really bad on him or if things get covered up or swept under the carpet might reflect very badly on him, not just the Aventus or, you know, you've got people just pushing these agendas and narratives and will continue if there's no change. It is something that you can you can almost understand why people are so sensitive about this, given what happened here, what, um, 13 years ago. But in fairness, the Quadrado one, I think this is the incident where he was basically lying down, right? So by the new rules, that's not actually a humble ball because... He was lying down his arms between the ball and the surface. So I can understand that one. But some of the others were questionable. I'm not going to go throwing around accusations. We're not throwing around accusations either. But it's it's one of those things. The big clubs always get these decisions. Juve are the biggest of the big clubs um, by the virtue of having more of the ball and attacking more than anyone else. I get they get I guess they get the rub of the green a little bit more than most sides do. But it's only normal to to see the backlash, I suppose, given what's happened here, not only in 2006, but throughout the 90s as well. Um, Kev, Gonzalo Higuain scored um, twice. He assisted Paolo Dybala for an excellent goal. Dybala, who himself was pretty impressive, and it kind of makes you think, what would have happened if Juve got their way and had have shipped these two out this summer? Yeah, absolutely, particularly as Ronaldo is now... Uh... Brackets closed, <laughs> brackets injured, uh, struggling. So he was uh, he was unavailable. But yeah, Dybala, um really sort of picked up the mantle of of key player. Even though it was Higuain who, who netted the goals, he was he had the bit between his teeth um, at times during this game, particularly when they came out for the second half and then fell behind. Um, yeah, where they'd be without them now is anyone's guess because they wouldn't have been you know bringing on the likes of Emre Chan which was roundly booed in the in the pub that I was watching it in in Turin <laughs> um there's not there wasn't many options for off the bench for them to do uh turn it around by Juve fans or Torino fans uh no it was it was Juve fans it was almost this collective boo stroke sigh when they lifted him off and um, my Italian is not good enough to to hear what some of the individuals were shouting at the screen, but I think I'm, I thought Fidney came on at one one maybe even, but they were not they were not impressed with the. That's right. I think it was one each when he came on. Mm. Um, all right, but Gonzalo Guain, Vito, give him some credit. Oh, he does deserve credit for his involvement in all three goals. Uh, the first goal he scored was a good goal on the turn, and the second one. Um, I think the play, well, Quadrado was involved somehow. A cross came from the right. And then, you know, it was a good finish then. 
And it was an excellent pass for him to set up Dybala for the third. Dybala had to do some work, you know, uh, dribble, beat a few defenders and slot the ball past Golini. But for Higuain to pick out that pass and just switch the ball from the left wing to the right, I think that was an excellent vision on his part. And it deserves credit for the positive aspects of his game against La Dea. I've been told by a worrying number of people in the last couple of months that I look quite like Gonzalo Higuain, given how he's perceived by most people. I personally disagree with it, but I'm not too pleased by those comparisons. I was actually speaking to someone recently. I was chatting to a group. And one of the guys goes, do you know who you look like? And I immediately, oh, here we go. I said, no, which don't, point, which don't point start. are you not pleased with, Connor? Um, <laughs> Which attribute are you less pleased with? A combination with? of a few. There's not one in particular, right? There's, there are a few of them that contribute. But this guy was like, you look like, you know that Juventus player? And I thought, oh, here we go. And then he said Pjanic. And I kind of thought, what? I don't. I, I see the Iguain resemblance a lot more than that. But thank you for your kind words. And I, I was just relieved that it wasn't Gonzalo. But anyway, I've had enough of that. And I'll... Sure enough, get that tomorrow when I'm back up in Milan. Anyway, Torino nil, Inter three. But Kev, you and I were both there. This wasn't football. No, it wasn't. We were chatting over a pizza after the game and neither of us could really take any positives or negatives from players because it was really it was just really hard to judge. They were they were swimming at times, some you know, <laughs> down in the corners of the pitch. Um, you know, the ball wasn't running true. Um, I kind of expected that to to not play into Torino's hands, but almost be a leveler for the game. And they never, they were never really at it. They just, you know, they they looked as unhappy as I was in those conditions. Uh, you and me both. There was a leak in the stand above where I was sitting, so I couldn't actually write during the game. So I had to drag my laptop down into the press conference room at halftime, write my report, and then tap away at it throughout the second half. It was a bit of a disaster. But I can't understand why this game was called was allowed to go ahead, Kev, because we saw Lecce Cagliari down in Puglia, I believe, it, called off yesterday evening, and it was played today, which is Monday afternoon. Um, that was called off. Why wasn't this? Was it just a case of the referee saying, oh, I'm not bothered coming back here again tomorrow? It wasn't fit for play. Um, I think it was. I think it was an element of it being maybe... The referee's probably thinking about it being the the, the prime time. Well, a you got into, you know, the, the TV slot, but also I I, can't, I saw the video of um I saw the video of them clearing the pitch down in Lecce yesterday, and I only saw that today. And a lot of the water placement there was in the goal mouth, whereas a lot of it was resting in the corner. There was one chat with this like um I suppose like a leaf blower blowing the water off that you you know we both saw. But it was it was down in the corners, I think. So if it had been through the middle of the pitch, I think it, it probably would have been called off. But there was right. enough. That, that was true. Kick off, but by the end, every step a player took was met with a splat. The ball wasn't moving properly. There was a, a case in the second half where I can't remember which inter defender it was, but they tried to play a pass out from the edge of their area, and the ball just stopped midway through what was supposed to be like a thirty-yard pass. Uh, you can't play football in those conditions. No, but I think if it had been nil-nil, you know, say going into the second half, they might have called it at half time. But Inter looked like they were going to just win it comfortably anyway. And then it was, if there was the appetite for both sides, and you know, maybe the manager not in the fourth, oh, sorry, the coach not in the fourth official's ear to to have it called off. I think they just they just got it done. You know, they both accepted, you know, into a happy they were winning. Torino probably accepted their fate. There was no pressure on the officials to sort of call it off, you know, even regardless of if the, the weather are going to be getting worse. And, and and the game just got done. And they just they just took it. They just accepted it. They got the result and we move on. Problem is, we don't move on, right? Because Andrea Botti went off. Um, Nicolò Barella went off injured. He's now out until the new year. He's going to have to be operated on. And if it wasn't for the conditions these injuries probably wouldn't have happened. Maybe. But, you know, you can have twists on dry turf. It's over the course of a season, that these things kind of level themselves out. Because if Inter had lost, they'd be moaning about the conditions being played because 
you know, Juve had won earlier in the day, but then it was really as wet in, in Berg- well, not as wet, but it was really, really bad conditions in Bergamo. You've just got to, it's over the course of a, a 38 game season, you just got to play the conditions that are dealt to you on the day if they're uh, able to be played. And it, and it, and it yeah, was. To well, a in the press conference afterwards, Antonio Conte, to his credit, didn't want to leave. He kept getting asked questions as he was standing up and walking towards the door, and he kept coming back and answering them, much to the displeasure of the Interpress officer. But one thing he kept saying is, this is only the start. This is only the start. This is only the start. We're one third of the way through the season. This is only the start. But Vito, the point is, they're now one third of the way through the season. It's more than just a good start, and they're still within touching distance of Juve. So they've got to start thinking of it as more than being just a positive first few games. Uh, I see your point, but I also see what Conte's trying to do too, because Inter had some decent starts. When Roberto Mancini returned to Inter, and even under Spalletti, but then in the second half of the season, the Nero Zuri would collapse. I think Conte is just trying to keep the team grounded and lower the expectations, so they just go through the whole process of the season. They maintain that consistency and not get too comfortable or too complacent. Unfortunately, as we've seen, Juventus know how to finish campaign strong, so. I think it's important to be fit mentally and psychologically, not just physically. So it's important that the players keep focused on the games that are coming ahead and not think of all the what ifs or possibilities. Kev, Stefan De Vrij scored the second on the night, and in doing so, he became Inter's 11th goal scorer of the season. It's more than anyone else has boasted. We know Lautaro Martinez and Romelu Lukaku keep firing them in, but. How important is it that they've, they've got goals all over the pitch? Yeah, and they could have done with this last season when Icardi had his meltdown and was frozen out of the side for a while because it was very, very obvious that everything was funneling through the Argentinian. And then this year, you know, if, they, if they'd had that contribution from other sources last season, they maybe wouldn't have been forced to sort of put him back in the side. Um, but it, it, it does show uh, a little bit more depth on the goal scoring front that when the chips are down towards the end of the season. If that can continue, then that will help them out and help them to keep chasing Juve down. Yeah, and uh, over to the strike force, Vito. I suppose just a quick few words about how they keep banging them in. Uh, well, they're excellent. And I think, uh, once again, that it's absolutely fundamental that they are playing well. Uh, again, Lukaku is... He's the second best goal scorer in Italy at the moment, so I think that's uh, very important. And uh, Lautaro, he just keeps getting better game after game. He does excellent again. He was actually, it was quite curious. He was given a bit of an ovation when he came off, and I didn't think this was his best game, but he, he was still quite, quite good. Um, a lot of the quite visible Torino supporting press applauded him off the pitch which was quite telling um, I may or may not have joined in on that because I love watching Lataro Martinez Valdo Mazzari is probably in a bit of trouble now Vito you love a bit of Mazzari so what do you think should Torino stick given the good job he's done with them up until this season or has his time passed I think his time has passed but I'm not sure if Torino would want to pull the plug on him just yet I think give him probably at least to the end of the season and then reassess things in the summer. The way this team is, though, I don't think they can really progress under his style of football or philosophy. So I think, you know, at least by the next summer, Urban Cairo needs to look at a coach that's a bit more proactive in his approach, not necessarily defensively naive, but someone who's going to utilise the more attack-minded players a bit better and also maybe even try and use the Youth Academy products a little bit more because yeah, there are just some players there, if not most of the squad. They're good players on their day, but they're very inconsistent. And I think in some ways, Mazzari's cautious approach contributes to that. Kev, wake up. Anything else to say on the game before we move on? 
No, I was just listening intently to Vito. Anything else to say on your time in Turin before we move on? I just no. I just don't want to go back there if, any time <laughs> if, it's, that, if it's that wet. You know, if, if somebody <laughs> yeah. can guarantee me it's not going to rain a hundred percent of the time, then I will. I will gladly go go back. But uh, yeah, I it, think I'll wait until March to go back once the weather is good again. All right. Anyway, moving on. Milan one, Napoli one. Two teams who are both pretty terrible at the moment. Kevin, the draw doesn't really suit either of them. No, it doesn't. But it's um, it, you know, it was a fairly um. Even game, so I think it's it, neither side looked like they, they deserve to win the game, so I give them the points. But they're both in a in a in a right state, and I think probably given Milan's last few seasons, you'd probably be more concerned if you're an Napoli fan, considering they've got um, a relatively difficult end to their Champions League campaign this week. I'll be watching them against Liverpool on Wednesday. Um, and they just look like they're imploding at the moment with all sorts of uh, coach and captain and players uh, standoff. It's a bit mad, isn't it? Napoli are just doing their level best to <laughs> destroy the season. They'll be doing well to get the top four at this rate. And I, I, I did say a to, lot of the players yeah. are. Go. Well, I said to Dov, I said to Dov as we were walking to Verona on Sunday that. They just look like a side that you can sometimes accept that a, a group of players, and some of those players have left, and I might even have made this point on a previous pod, have just come to sort of the natural conclusion. And it's unfortunate if you haven't been able to purchase players to have an easy transition into maybe another generation of side. And maybe now they, they have to have that clear out in the, you know, you wouldn't do it mid-season, but maybe they need to have that clear out in the summer. Even if you haven't got the finances to buy ready-made replacements but then you go with maybe you know particularly if the coach's time's up there if you then go with a coach that wants to maybe bring through some youth take a side on except that you're maybe going to miss champions league football for you'd like to hope a season maybe at most but maybe maintain european football and i say it just might be the end of that era that started with probably benitez with albio and higuain and then moved on to mertens taking a prominent role and and they just need a change. It does look like a lot is going to change, <laughs> whether it's in January or at the end of the season. Uh, some positive news. Milan got a point, which for Milan is pretty good this season. Uh, Jack's back. Bonaventura scored what our FIF at the games correspondent, Dov Schiavone, described as the best thing Milan have done this season. And it's good to see, Vito. Certainly is. It was a fabulous strike on Bonaventura's part. And generally speaking, he was back in his natural role as a left winger. So that was great to see. It seems that when he's not in the team, they just seem to miss a bit of attacking spark. So I think it's really important that he stays fit because he can chip in with the odd goal from the wings. And some of his goals are actually quite nice to watch, especially that strike to level the scores. I think it's against Napoli that he always does it, right? Wasn't there that goal, the goal of the month, either last season or probably the year before, given his injury problems last year, the, like, sliced volley as it came across him? It was really, really nice. Anyway, it's good to see Jack back. A very, very likable player who can do just about anything. Considering when he came through at Atalanta, he was kind of a at Milan. He does basically everything. Next up, Bologna 2, Parma 2. For once, I wasn't at a Parma game. And there's no surprise, Dejan Kuluzevsky was dropping gems, Kev. Another great performance, another great goal, and he came close to scoring another. The kid's impressive. Yeah, I only got to see the highlights of this, and it, it looked like it was a showreel just for him. I think that, that's how much of an influence he had on the game um, at times from an attacking point of uh, view for, for Parma. And he, he does look, he looks an absolute talent. And uh, the goal, brilliantly taken. Yeah, the, the problem is now, I don't say problem, the likes of Inter and Juve want them, Manchester United want them, but he, he said last week that he's found the perfect club in Parma, and you would hope that that's more than just 
kind of like PR stuff to keep the fans happy, you would hope that he does see it as that at least until the end of this season. Because he could go somewhere bigger and not play for the rest of the season and then be looked back at in five years as a guy who flashed in the pan for, what, six months, Fido. Are you as hopeful as I am that Kudoski will stay in Parma rather than move on? I hope he does stay on for the rest of the season, especially considering his age. Even if one of the big clubs do buy him in January, especially the Italian ones, I'd like to think that he will remain at Parma at the end of the season. If he went to a non-Italian club, I do have that feeling that if he was purchased in January, he would just sit on the bench because then they would say, oh, he's not ready. He's too raw, this and that. At Parma, he's an important part of the team, even at 19 years old. And he's got this great confidence, not just the skill set. You know, he's able to take the game on. And when I look at him and his other teammates on the pitch, not only did he just uh, have that composure, but he had just that effectiveness on the ball, the, the ability to use the ball wisely, look at some of his other team, especially someone like Matias Brocati. He tried to invent stuff, but he couldn't hang on to the ball or release the ball at the right time. Kulusevski, at his age, knows when to release the ball. And he probably should have had another goal or two as well because the first one was great, but if those other ones went in, mm. they would have added to the whole it's real already. Yeah, he did that thing where he cut in from the right and curled one, basically trying to replicate what he had already scored with. And it came back off the post. But speaking of comebacks, Vito Il Capitano e Tornato, Bruno's back. How big of a boost is that? Very important for the defence. I remember particularly in the first half, he made a very good block. I think it was from uh, either Orsolini cross or shot from one of the other players. But I think to have him there and to guide uh, Dumaku, the Albanian player that they got from Casenza, mm. I think... Uh, It'll be a very good mentor for him, like he was for Bastoni last season. Speaking of Dermaku, he's huge. Every time he walks through the mix on, I'm terrified. He's massive. It's unbelievable. If you're in Parma, go to a Parma game just to see how big he is and sit by the pitch because you don't really notice it from up above. But yeah, it's quite terrifying. Jemaya and Palacio, Kev, the old boys, <laughs> off from Bruno Alves, they've still got it as well. They both played yeah. well. That's your Miley goal. Oh my god, that that's goal of the month. I don't I don't care about anything else. It was a strange goal because obviously it's injury time. They're two one down, and that's usually where you play the percentages. You know, you try and take it down. You try and knock it across the box. If they're you know two goals up, then you just you know you can have a fresh at it. You know, there's sort of seconds left. But he has just decided to hit that, and I, it has stayed hit. It was it just like has boom. stayed hit. He probably made the groundsman's job a bit easier because he didn't have to take down the net afterwards because Jamali had already sorted it out. But my God, power in that was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. If you've not seen it, listeners, go and find it. Serie YouTube channel is actually quite good, to be fair to them. Find it on that. It, I watched it on the train and I just made a noise oh my god that's unbelievable the power phenomenal um there was another thing i wanted to say about this game but i've gone completely blank on it that's good isn't Se- it sepe stuffing uh, up on uh, what's it, it. palacio's goal yeah good old luigi kev we were only talking about him in the pizzeria in turin weren't we? And I was thinking, he's not actually made too many mistakes this week, or this season. Less yeah, than 12 he... hours later, he served one up. Well, well, I was going to be really cruel and say that he flapped, <clears throat> flapped a little bit at the Jamali effort, but we'll, we'll give him that one. But yeah, that <laughs> you know, that, that Palacio header, because it almost rolled off his shoulder as much yeah. as his head. Oh now. my and, God. Yeah, maybe, maybe they should just sign Cacciatore and put him in goal. Uh, Maybe they should did... sign Robin Olsen and put him in goal. Well, yeah. But, I mean, I don't know why. why is, what's he doing? He, he's a professional. Uh, I, I, look, I've said enough about Luigi Zappa for the last season and a bit. Um, Lazio, no, Sassuolo won Lazio too. That's the correct order. This was a good game and I was dry, so I was 
a lot happier. But the, it was football. The ball was, was rolling on the ground. It wasn't stopping in the middle of a pass. It, it was nice. It was nice for Chiro Mobile. Scored his 15th goal of the season. Already levelling his tally for the entirety of last year. Kev, don't move like that again, uh, please. But Vito Immobile, 15 goals in 13 games. He's a phenomenon. Oh, I think we've come up with enough uh, superlatives to describe him, especially at club level. But this season's really been something else for him. I mean, to average a goal more, you know, average more than a goal a game, I think that's incredibly exceptional. And they're well in the Champions League spots now. They're in third place. They're probably going to go out of the Europa, Europa League so they can focus on Serie A. And I think this is a great chance for them to cement a place in the Champions League for 2020-21. Not yeah, only that. In, yeah, yeah you, You'd expect them to hold on to it based on what we've seen from the other teams this season. Mm. Yeah, well, I think it's... Um, yeah, they're in with a chance to hold on this time and... Look, it looks like Juventus and then Inter are pretty comfortable as a top two. But with the way he's been playing and also the way Luis Alberto's been playing, uh, they can really help Lazio to be the best of the rest for this season. Luis Alberto, Kev, he's got 10 assists only in Serie A this season. We've only played 13 games. Lazio have only scored 30 goals. So he assists one in three Lazio goals. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we, we had him at, at Liverpool and I think he probably got a little bit of a bad reputation because of the probably the the size of the move. Um, and, you know, you kind of forget how young he was at the time and he came from playing almost... Uh, we, we bought him, I can't remember. If, anyway, anyway, we got him from some, somewhere. But I, I'd still do worry if you have to carry him for any period of the game if you're also carrying the likes of Milinkovic Savage. Not not necessarily probably carry is not the right term, but where you've got those players that will drift in and out of games and whether um when it comes to the the end of the season and if they were to drop some points and be having a fight out uh, for a Champions League spot, um whether he'll step up then. Um he he seemed to be a little bit of a fair weather player at times where he'd have spells of really productive um, periods within, you know, compared you know, with goals and assists and things, and then you know a couple of months where you wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be doing anything, and then he'll sort of come back, prop, pop back up again in March. But if he can be consistent across the season, then they've they've got a player on their hands there at Lazio by the looks of it. Other side of the city, Roma beat Brescia three 0 Chris Smalling is the best player the world has ever seen. Vito discussed. Well. He's looking rather incredible in Italy at the moment. And again, they've come up with a new nickname for him, even on the Serie A YouTube channel. His nickname is Smoldini. So make of that what you will. <laughs> that was great. Give, give the Roma admin some credit for the sneaky edit on that picture. Because was it, it was AS Roma again. They put up the tweet saying he's now scored two Serie A goals. First Englishman to do it since Beckham in 2008-9. Picture of Bex hugging Paolo Maldini and they put a little S on Maldini's shirt before his name, which it's a lovely touch. And Chris Molling's <laughs> good. So let's give him some credit, Kev. I don't like Smaldini. The, the, the term. You're an old grumpy man. Oh, I, don't, I don't like this. I, don't, <laughs> I, just don't, I don't like the Smaldini. You know, you know, he has to be his own man. <laughs> it's a joke, Kev. It, it was I a joke, know, but it's almost it's almost poking fun at how comical he was as a defender at United by Dick by comparing him with this little quirk against probably arguably one of the best defenders of all time. I don't know. I just think I don't see. I think it's poking fun at Manchester United, to be honest, because I, I he's, think it's he's poking fun player. at how bad he was at Manchester United, and I, I think sometimes it would be nice if they could just let someone come to the country and, you know, integrate without, you know, kind of, yeah, you know, I suppose it's all bants, uh, <laughs> you know, social media bants, but I don't know. I just, I just, I mean, they could give him, show a little bit more respect. 
Um, Mario Balotelli didn't feature. There was obviously that argument in training with coach Fabio Rosso. And I don't know if you guys have seen this today, but yeah. uh, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? President yes, Cellino right. of Brescia was, was asked in quite a formal situation. I mean, he's standing in front of a microphone in front of a Serie A team background. He was asked about Balotelli's future and he said, what can I tell you? He's black and he's working on clearing himself. Really? Russia released a statement today to say that it was a, it was a joke. Silly us for not understanding the humour there. But should they have probably just said, yeah, sorry about that? Because he's not laughing when he says it, really. You know, and it's not funny. But wasn't there a, wasn't there a third statement saying that actually it wasn't, a, you know... It wasn't. It either wasn't a joke or it wasn't a, you know, a mistranslation. And it did. It did throw me off when I saw it this, this afternoon because of that whole. I couldn't quite understand the clearing term at the end. You know what he was clearing himself from because you know he certainly didn't do anything wrong against Hellas Verona the other week. Uh, well, not in my eyes, anyway. Well, no, you would think that, right? But a lot of people out there think he did. And I think it's oh. it's a real shame when any any player. Um, and this seems to happen a bit more for Mario than than others in in recent years. Gets gets a reputation either through their own actions that have then sort of proceeded that they just never shake that tag of it maybe not being as professional as other people in training and things. Uh, and he's he's going to be a forever labelled with that, and it, it's it's unfair on on him. And I think sometimes in in the past it's been unfair on other individuals. You just they just don't shake it, but that, that's that's moving aside of the stupid racist comments of a an owner. Yeah. Um, let's not do that again, shall we? We just move on. Uh, no, we need to give Roma some credit. We spoke about them briefly a couple of weeks ago. Pelo Fonseca has done a fine job there. They're fifth, still behind Cagliari, but they look like they could really challenge for the top four. Them and Lazio are probably front runners now for third and fourth place, Pizza. Yeah, they're definitely up for the fights, and I think given the circumstances that were in in previous weeks, Fonseca has managed to make them a competitive side, even with the injury woes. Some players have come back now, and yeah, they're really coming good. As we've mentioned before, Smalling was excellent, especially with how he contributed offensively, not just defensively. Jacko. He scored the third goal, which seemed a bit fortunate, but he was probably unlucky to be offside in other occasions. And, yeah, um, Gianluca Mancini, he's starting to come good at Roma too. He was used as a defensive midfielder in other games. In this game, he returned to the defence. And that goal to put Roma 2-0 up, that was like a, like a true centre-forwards goal. That was not the strike of a defender. That was something special. Yeah. Uh, if you pause it when he actually takes the shot, where he puts it, it's not on. I don't know why he went that way, but the, the technique required <laughs> to execute that is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. But we discussed, he's not actually Gianluca Mancini. He is Andrea Pirlo playing with a shaved head. So, it's not that surprising. Let's come <laughs> back up north, shall we? Alice Verona won Fiorentina nil. Um, it might seem like a surprising result, but Verona are now ahead of Fiorentina. And... Uh, were the yellow blue worthy of the three points? Oh, absolutely! They were, they were, they were brilliant. Fiorentina were bad. Um, you know, Ribery looks so far beyond anybody else on the pitch for Fiorentina at the moment. Chiesa was on the bench. He certainly didn't. He didn't certainly didn't feature. But yeah, I, yeah. I think I I hear the name Hellas Verona and obviously newly promoted, um, yo-yoed up and down and. It was a real solid team performance. They 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 were wasteful, although um, Fiorentina goalkeeper did make some saves. I think they 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 missed some chances as well, and were, and were fully deserving of their of their victory. Yeah, I just I mean it, we discussed it. It's good to see the promoted teams not all being seventeenth or eighteenth, nineteenth, and twentieth. There's only one of the new new boys. In the bottom three, so long may that continue, I suppose. Speaking of the relegation zone, Vito, your boys aren't in there anymore. Sampdoria 2, Udinese 1, they're out of the bottom three. Just. They're out of the yeah. bottom three. 
And the important part is that we're out of the bottom three, regardless if it's just out. And then you can also say we're not too far from mid-table. So with this uh, Ranieri revolution, uh, things might look more promising. But look, focusing on this game on task, um, it was a great result. Um, great, great effort from the lads for the persistence. And yeah, it's really a relief to finally get out of the relegation zone because I do think we're not a relegation side. We've got a better squad than that. And Manolo Gabbiadini, he had a shocker, shocking miss early in the game, but he had a few other attempts to score afterwards, and he just produced an absolute pearl of a free kick to make it 1-1. Well, fabulous stuff. We were speaking about this, Kev, because there are a few sides in Serie A who risk being too good to go down. One of them. So, yeah, um, they haven't looked it in recent weeks, but you know, Vito knows better than I do on the, the squad depth. But um, yeah, I think with the way that the, the newly promoted sides are performing, I think we could see as many as two what you would class as surprise surprising sides go down. Um, and and as, as good as the goals were, um, I hate to say it, Vito, but I think you're in for a hard season. Um, right, Vito, I'm going to give you 60 seconds max. I understand you want to get something off your chest, right? So my timer has started now. Go. Okay. Now, for those who have seen my Twitter feed, I have retweeted some comments from the Macedonian striker or North Macedonian striker, Nestorovsky. He tried to claim that Udinese were the only ones in the game and that Sampdoria fans only made noise when Gaston Ramirez made it 2-1. That is a load of rubbish. Sampdoria fans are some of the best fans in world football. Even when the team was playing rubbish under Di Francesco, they were singing, they were happy, they were cheering on the team. Oh, incredible atmosphere from those fans and I can't wait to be with them again. As for Udinese, it was an even game until the sending off of Yayalo. Then we took control of the game and we should have won by a lot more. Not only that, Udinese, they've got color stadiums at the Dutch Arena and they barely have any fans. So don't worry about us. Focus on yourselves. And it looks like you're going to Serie B. Ciao, ciao. Nicely done. 58 seconds. Good job. Proud of you, Vito. Might do that from now on. Put you on the time limit. You'll get it wrapped up nicely. Um, that'll do for that game. We will, uh, right, let's say Cagliari, I suppose Cagliari are big dogs now. They, they went to Puglia, they stayed overnight, probably not expecting to. They played on Monday afternoon. Kev, I don't know why you're smiling like that. Finished two each, three players were sent off. Good game. Pizza. No, no Kev. I was going to tell you, I was going to just tell you what I'm smiling about. Okay, so, all right. after we returned from Verona... We had a delay on the train, which you're more than accustomed to. And with Trenitalia. Wow. Uh, yes, I'm not as uh, up together with which train I was on yet. If it was um, delayed, it will have been. But we dropped our bags and went, let's go. Go, go, go. Let's go get to the second half of the pub. Walked into the pub and there was no football on the screens. We went up, we went up to the bar. And said, can you put the football on for us? They went, oh, it's been called off. And we're like, oh, my God. Neither of us even bothered to check that the game was going ahead. So we sort of ventured out into the wet Milanese evening for no reason whatsoever. Apart from staying out drinking late night after that. But, yeah, so it tickled me. How I don't crazy. understand how you can play it a day later, though. I suppose weird, fans it? don't travel or, you know, make accommodation or have work. Maybe three o'clock on a Monday. Yeah, it was o'clock. amazing, right? <laughs> three o'clock on a Monday afternoon. Unbelievable. Only in Italy. Um, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Spa 1, Genoa 1. That was Monday evening. Uh, they're both in the bottom three. One of them needed to win this. Spa being at home. Disappointed with this, Vito? I reckon both sides will be disappointed with it. And Genoa more so, more so because in the last 20 minutes, they looked like they could have won the game. They had more chances and they were playing better. Not only that, this result benefited Sampdoria 
more than those two sides. So I'm sure the general fans would be a bit salty about that because that leaves us clear out of relegation, at least for a week. Are you happier about Sam being out of the relegation zone or Genoa being in the relegation zone? Oh, us being out of it. I don't want to, you know, I want I to believe that. be in Italy. Look, you, you could, you uh, it, the Doria mentality is different to the general visit, <laughs> the Genoano mentality. The Genoano loves to see some Doria fail. For us, it's our own successes that take priority. Don't get me wrong. I still like the saltiness of the general veto. Okay. In these circumstances. No, it is very hard for them. But look, with Genoa, on you know, from a neutral's perspective, it does hurt them as it does spell. And of course, for the new coach Tiago Motta, he'll be happy with the point because Preziosi, the president, is a nutter and he's gonna make sure he doesn't <laughs> lose and get the boot. Lawsuit coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> I've nothing else to say. We'll, we're at, we'll end it on that note. Um, anything more to add on anything, Vito, except for Jan or Sampdoria? Well, just going back to the Lecce Coyote game, I'm surprised Kev didn't talk about uh, his favourite goalkeeper, Robin Olsen, getting sent off. Him and Lapadula. I was about to apologise for my poor pub uh, story. Over, sort of overtaking the actual action on the pitch at Lecce and the, the strange, the strange goings on at the corner, at the at the penalty kick and the whole striking him out and then laying on the floor. I would have, I would have sent. It was Lapadula, wasn't it? I sent off. I yeah, Lapadula. And uh, that I would have up sent off just for the amount of time he, he he laid on the the ground. After level with you guys because of the ridiculous time it was played. I've not seen anything from this game other than the score oh, and. Is a yeah, I. I yeah, watch it just for the fun of, of that. They sort of butt <laughs> chests and then Olsen goes, I think, to sort of shove Lapadula in the chest. Or <laughs> but he's so he's he's that much taller than him that he almost pushes him in the throat. And then Lapadula lays down as if Mike Tyson's floored him and stays there for <laughs> what what appeared like a couple of minutes, even on even on the shortened yeah. <laughs> uh, highlight. But uh, yeah, it was huh. ridiculous. Oh, Handbags. I mean, I mean, drama though, right? There was what two goals and three red cards in the last ten minutes. That's amazing, <laughs> absolutely phenomenal stuff. But all right, say goodbye, Kev. Uh, goodbye, Kev. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, ciao. <laughs>